afternoon. Who's awake? I, yeah, I learned the word for the coma after the lunch, but I've forgotten what it is. <laughs> we call it the itis sometimes, if that translates. Hi, I'm Jeff. I'm uh, here from North America, as you might have guessed. And I'm going to talk a bit about what is new in OpenNMS 1.12. How many OpenNMS users have I got in the room? OK, OK. Any OpenNMS curious? And the rest of you are just lost? <laughs> or looking for a place to have a nap? Good. So a bit of an agenda here before I launch in. I'll cover who I am, what OpenNMS is, which seems to be indicated. Uh, a little bit about its functional areas, and then I'll jump into the new features, uh, which I've divided into broad areas of configuration helpers, end user helpers, infrastructure, integration, performance improvements, device coverage improvements, improvements in Link D, which is our topology discovery daemon, shiny stuff, and architectural boring stuff. So I'll start. Who am I? I'm just this guy. Um, I've been a systems management nerd for going on 15 years now, I suppose. Systems and network management. Uh, my first real job doing systems and network management was with NASA. Note the bolded first A, that's very important. It's the people who put stuff in space, not the people who put malware on your chancellor's handy. <laughs> Um, from that job, I went to a vendor, a proprietary vendor in the network management space called uh, Empire or Concord. Any of you guys use their stuff ever? No? Okay. They made pretty good stuff. That's where I learned what a real network management was about. Um, I got laid off after that company got acquired by Computer Associates. No booze? Didn't really relish working there anyway. So from there, I went to Bell South, which was a uh, sort of a miniature telecom for the southeastern part of the United States. That's now part of AT&T. And after I spent some time there and played with OpenNMS for the first time, um, I eventually landed here at the OpenNMS group, which is where I am today. We're the commercial services and support company that sponsors the OpenNMS project and tries to build a community around it and a customer base around it. And I've met a lot of really smart people, really beautiful people, and people who are surprisingly awake after lunch. OK, what then is this OpenNMS thingy? We have a sort of elevator pitch for it. If you've got 20 seconds to tell somebody what it is you do, this is what it is. OpenNMS is the world's first enterprise-grade network management platform developed under the open source model. And I always like to break that down. So let's talk about it a bit. World's first. We actually can back that up. We were SourceForge project number 4141. The NetSaint project actually predates us, which was the precursor to Nagios, many of you probably know. Uh, but development on OpenNMS had started sooner, and as we'll see in a second, it's not the same thing. Um, OpenNMS project was registered on SourceForge in March of 2000. Again, development started a bit earlier. It's hard to say exactly when development started because it was a startup. Okay, so we covered world first. Let's cover enterprise grade. What does that mean? Well, basically it means scalability to tens of thousands of nodes and interfaces is sort of baked into the design. It was originally one of the design goals. So instead of, well, I've got a few dozen or a few hundred of these things, I'd like to see if they're up, it was more, I've got hundreds of thousands of things, and I'd like to see if some of those are up, see what they're doing, and generally be a, a more enterprisey solution. So if any of you have used things like OpenView Node Manager or Tivoli NetView, or Micromuse Netcool, which is now confusingly called Tivoli, since IBM acquired it. Those are the sort of things that we took our inspiration from in the design of OpenNMS. Um, and the hallmark feature that really makes the scalability go is that it is an extensible and event-driven architecture under the hood. So everything that happens inside OpenNMS is really driven by events. All right. 
Also, I say that it's a network management platform, and we make that distinction carefully. OpenNMS is not an application, it is an application platform. It lets you build exactly the application management application that you need. So we give you lots and lots of knobs, sometimes an overwhelming number of knobs that you can fiddle with. We give you uh, very customizable options in every aspect of the operation of the platform. The configuration is an XML, which can be a little disgusting to work with sometimes, but it has the advantage of being easy for machines to understand and easy for people to understand. We also have bunches and bunches of APIs, some of them official, some of them less official, and that makes it easy to add new integration points with the platform. Okay, and then finally, OpenNMS is developed under the open source model. The entire code base is GPLv3. We changed a few years ago from GPLv2. The enterprise version is the only version, so we don't do the open core thing. It's always going to be a free platform. All the work that we do on the platform is done in the public SCM. Uh, currently, that's GitHub. And even all the sponsored work that our commercial customers ask us to do, that's also done in the public SCM. So all the work that we're doing is right there for anybody to go check out, build, play with. All right. So let me launch into a little bit about what OpenNMS does. We used to say that there are three halves of OpenNMS. Now we're sort of up to five halves. We have the provisioning piece. Provisioning to us just means getting nodes in. We have the service assurance piece, which is sort of analogous to what Nagios was originally designed to do, is stuff up or down. We have a performance management piece, which is sort of like some of the stuff that Nagios has been extended over the years to do. We have event management, and we have reporting and presentation. And I'll go into a little bit of those. Provisioning is sort of, a, if you're a telco person, then provisioning has already a specific meaning. We have a different one. For OpenNMS, provisioning just means getting stuff into our model. So we populate the model with nodes. Those nodes have interfaces, and those interfaces have services on them. A service can be anything from ICMP up to an abstract very complicated service that represents a web transaction or something like that. Then we have the service assurance component, which is also known as polling. That's the is it up or not question. We support a wide range of services, again, from ICMP up through very complicated multi-step services that depend on multiple systems. All of these are handled from a single polar daemon using Java classes, which are called polar monitors. Uh, the response times are kept in the system, and you can optionally persist those to RRD files. You can look at those as graphs, and you can also run thresholds against them so that if a service is up but performing slower than you would like, you can create an event that says, this is slower than I would like, even though it's not down. If we do find with the polar, though, that a service is down, then we create an event and alarms and also an outage record so we can do SLA reporting from the database. All right, I'll jump next to performance management, which is another half of OpenNMS. We collect, store, and analyze performance data, which we think of as anything that is numeric and time series, the sort of thing that goes neatly into an RRD file. The question we try to answer with performance data collection is, how is it running? Or at least try to help you be able to answer. We can collect data via a number of different protocols. SNMP, of course, was our original and probably still our strongest one. Uh, we have very good support now for JMX, for JDBC, WMI. We even support NS Client, if you want to get your hands dirty with that, and a number of others as well. What can you do with the performance data once it's collected? You can make resource graphs, which are the standard sort of RRD tool, or in our case, JRobin by default which is just like RRD tool, but Java. Uh, you can evaluate the performance data against thresholds as it's being collected. So you can say if the file system is too full, then create an event, and the event becomes an alarm. And alarms can do other interesting things and become workflow entities. They can become trouble tickets. All right, that brings me to event management. Events, as I mentioned before, are really the currency of the platform. They are what makes it go. We can take in events from a number of different sources. We have internal events, which are generated by OpenNMS itself. 
We have SNMP traps as an event source. So if you send an SNMP trap to OpenNMS and you have event definitions that match that trap, it turns into an event. It's the same kind of event as the internal ones. They are comparable. They're first class citizens. You can do the same with syslog messages using regular expressions to recognize those. We also have the notion of events, which are immutable historical records of things that happened in your network, versus alarms, which are things that you know matter to your operators. And alarms also have the notion of deduplication, so you could have a single alarm that represents one million events that are somehow related via a reduction key. And alarms are designed to be workflow entities that a knock operator type person would work with as a primary entity. You can also create notifications based on events. Notifications are a way of sending outside the system a record of some event. Email is probably by far the most popular way to deliver notifications, but we can also deliver those via XMPP and a number of other methods. And then finally, we have some help desk integrations which tie into the event and alarm subsystem, which let you create trouble tickets in a foreign help desk system based on alarms that are inside OpenNMS. And it enables a bi-directional synchronization. Finally, reporting and presentation. Um, the central component of the reporting and presentation subsystem is the web app. It's a Java web app. It lets you create ad hoc resource graphs, which are probably the most used feature of the web app for most people. It also has browsers to let you look at your events and alarm histories. There's a Jasper reports integration, thanks to Mr. Tolmer up here in the front. There's uh, actually we're up to four, I think four different maps now. We used to hate maps, now we love them because we have good ones. And uh, finally, we've also got a REST API that's part of our web app, which is the, definitely the new hotness in terms of ways to interface with the platform. Okay, so we've got a little bit of a background on what the system does. Let's talk about what's new. New stuff, we've got a JMX configurator, an SNMP MIB compiler, SNMP data collection configurator, and we have split the graphs configuration. This is, these are things that are new between 1.10 and 1.12. Let me pause for a second and ask, of those using OpenNMS, how many are already on 1.12? Nobody, okay, how many are on 1.10? 1.8? One dot six. Okay. So we have this JMX configurator, which uh, is affectionately called the JMX Zaugblase. The Germans get it. The non-Germans don't. It's a reference to a comedy sketch. It uh, sucks in information from a JMX connection about the managed beans, the management beans or M beans that that JMX application is exporting, and it spits out, on the other side, data collection definitions and graph definitions, which tell OpenNMS how to gather data and how to represent the data pictorially. It's a big, big, big time savings because there tend to be a lot of attributes on these mBeans, and their names tend to be pretty long. So we also do automatic data source name compression using a dictionary strategy. So you can compress these to 19 characters because everybody loves compressing names to 19 characters for RRD tool. Don't we all? Yeah. Big, big, big time savings. Uh, this is a community contribution from Deutschland. We've also got a new SNMP MIB compiler. I'll use the word compiler loosely because it does a lot more than just compile. It allows you to upload MIB definitions and from those MIB definitions, you can create event definitions for the traps, if there are any traps in that MIB definition, and SNMP data collection definitions for the gettable objects, if there are some of those in it. It used to be that you had to go use these two different command line tools that were very fussy. You had to deal with XML files directly, which, great, for somebody like me who lives and breathes this stuff is fine, but for the average person starting out, pretty steep learning curve. So that learning curve is almost entirely gone now. You can just upload the MIBs, compile them, create the definitions, handle the definitions, folding them into your configuration, all without ever leaving the web app, which is pretty cool, I think. Um, all the outputs are totally customizable, and again, you never need to touch the XML files again once you're using this feature. 
And that's not a community contribution, that's actually a, an employee of OpenNMS group contribution, but I went ahead and put the Venezuelan flag on there because Alejandro, who did this work, is really awesome. And he's from Venezuela originally. This is a screenshot of it, just so that you can see that it's real, it's not a mock-up. I don't have a live demo, unfortunately, because my laptop doesn't like the Beamer, but there's a screenshot of it. All right. Uh, related to data collection, we've in 1.12, we're by default splitting the snmpgraph.properties file into a top-level file plus an snmpgraph.properties.d directory. That's a lot of dots, but it's the way it is. Um, and it doesn't really stop the fact that creating RRD tool-style graphs just sucks. How many people like doing that? Hate doing that? Yeah. Yeah, would rather be eaten alive by wolverines. Yeah, but at least now maintaining the changes that you might make to the graph definitions is less sucky because instead of editing one giant monolithic file, you're editing a bunch of smaller files. It's still just as error prone as it was in terms of white space sensitivity and that stuff, but it's better. Um, this also mirrors the data collection configuration split that we did in OpenNMS 1.10. This is just sort of finishing that job. It's the other side of it. And this was another community contribution from Craig Miskell of, of New Zealand. Cool. All right, so on to end user helpful things. We've got three of those, and I'll just dive right into them. Uh, the first of these is one that I, I think mostly Ronnie up here in the front worked on, uh, along with some of our other German guys, in cooperation with a customer of ours in Sweden. It is called the Nodes with Pending Problems box. So it used to be we had this box on the front page of the web app that says nodes with outages, which is great. It told you, if, told you all the nodes that were currently in an outage state. But the world's kind of changing, moving along to be a less outage-centric view and a more workflow-centric view. So we now, by default, turn on this nodes with pending problems, which instead of outages, looks at alarms that are unacknowledged on your nodes. If you're old school like me, you can change it back. Okay, uh, new topographical map. This is cool, this was a long time coming. Uh, this was a feature that was sponsored largely by Juniper, who's a customer of ours. It is not the OpenNMS topographical map of yesterday. Any of you guys ever used that old map? Yeah, it wasn't the most fun to work with, perhaps. You had to build the maps by hand. These maps are entirely self-made. They're automatically laid out. You still have to have link topology in order to get them to work, but they're automatically laid out, which helps a lot. And they are much sexier looking. They're much more 21st century than the old map. Um, one of the requirements from Juniper was actually that it has to be sexy. That, those are the words that they used. And uh, I think we delivered. We used the Vaden framework. Any of you guys use Vaden? No? It's a uh, web application framework that ties neatly into Java. Uh, we used Vaden to uh, bootstrap this map and some other technologies, all of which I don't entirely understand, to uh, build the rest of it. It renders the topology from LinkD, which is our historical link data gathering daemon, but it can also represent other topologies. So another advance that we've had in recent years is the ability to have multiple topologies. So in addition to like a layer two topology that Link D gathers, you can have other topologies that, for instance, the VMware integration, which I'll talk about soon, will gather as well. And you can, it's just a different perspective of looking at how your network is laid out. Speaking of being laid out, we have pluggable layout algorithms. A whole bunch of them ship in the box and you can switch them up so you can change the layout for a given map to one that better suits the topology or the way you prefer to see it visualized. Uh, we've also got semantic zooming and scoping, which just is a fancy way of saying that if you select some nodes in the left-hand pane, those nodes will be what's zoomed into. It's a very sexy zoom. It's sort of Google Earthy. It's neat. It's really pretty. And it's also very functional. Um, we have integrated node and alarm browser widgets right in the bottom of that map. So you can, it's just a tabbed interface there. You can look at all the nodes that are represented in the current topology view and all of the alarms, and you can browse to those node and alarm details from there as well. Um, it's a great map, but 
as one of our guys discovered recently, it may not be entirely free of bugs. That's an actual topology. <laughs> not sure how that happened, but that, that's an actual topology. Okay, more maps. Yay, we've got more maps. Um, we actually now have a geographical node map. We never had one of those before. We used to have a geographical remote polar map, but never a geo node map. We used Vaden again and the leaflet framework for creating this geo map. Uh, it automatically geocodes the addresses, if you have them, for all of your nodes. So you put in address one, address two, city, state, country, and it does its best to use either the OpenStreetMap nominatum geocoder or the Google Maps geocoder to turn those into lat long pairs, and it plots those on the map. I'll have a screenshot of it in a second. Um, it also features zoom level aware node grouping. So if you're zoomed all the way out to the whole world, then you're going to see one grouping of nodes for each area that's appropriate for that zoom level. But as you zoom in more, you'll start to see those groups getting exploded and either smaller groups or individual nodes will begin to appear. Um, and then finally, we have alarm severity indication right on the badges that are on the markers on the map. So you can see what the highest severity is of a given node group, which is pretty cool. So here you can see in this screenshot, we've got a group of nodes up here in New York that has a major severity as the highest severity. We've got another one up here in Ohio or close by Ohio that has a minor severity. And then we have another grouping down here. Actually, these two are individual nodes. This is a grouping of, I don't know if you can read it in the back, but 39 nodes in that grouping in the North Carolina area where our headquarters is in the States. And if you click on that, which I've done in this, you can actually see the highest alarm level the nodes, what the IP address is of the indicated interface that has the alarm on it. So it's, it's a really cool way to visualize your nodes. Okay, we also got some new stuff in terms of infrastructure, stuff we think of as being plumbing that most people don't ever think about, but it's our job to think about as people who do monitoring. So we've got a couple of, actually these are both community contributions. Uh, we've got a new access point monitor, which was contributed by some users in Canada, in Quebec. It intelligently monitors your uh, Wi-Fi wi or VLAN access points. Uh, it doesn't try to do the stupid thing of talking directly to the APs because they are invariably stupid boxes with crappy SNMP agents, if any agents at all, and they're always going on and off the air. So this approaches that problem by talking instead to the wireless controller. So far, it supports Motorola and Aruba controllers. I think Motorola is uh, the Canopy stuff. Anybody use their, their stuff? Aruba stuff either? So nobody cares. But uh, it, it's actually really slick. It, uh, it represents the nodes, even though it's not talking directly to the APs, it represents the APs as if they were regular nodes. And you can see them come on and offline if they disconnect from the controller. Uh, or if they're reporting problems via the controller, you can see those represented as well. So that was a really, really good ad, I think. We've got another infrastructure ad, which I think a lot of people will find to be very exciting. I know I do. Um, it's a VMware vSphere integration. How many VMware users do we have? Wow, that's a lot. Okay, cool. So you guys might want to think about playing with this thing. Um, it is a native integration. It uses the VMware vSphere SOAP API as well as the SIM API for talking to host systems. So all you need to do to get your whole infrastructure, your whole virtual data center or data centers imported to OpenNMS is basically just point OpenNMS's provisioner at your vSphere server or servers. It needs a username and password, of course, which, were, which have specific permissions, and it talks to the vSphere server and asks, give me your nodes, give me your host systems, give me your virtual machines, represents those in the OpenNMS model automatically. You don't have to discover them or add them manually. It just slurps them directly out of vSphere, and boom, you have your virtual infrastructure in OpenNMS. We gather topology automatically, which can be represented in that topo map that I showed you a few slides back, which is really neat. We also do polling or service assurance. We have health indicators on the host systems and on the virtual machines, which are exactly analogous to what you would see in the vSphere 
client if you were running that on your desktop, except right there it is in OpenNMS. You don't have to go to the vSphere client. We also do data collection. We probably do way too much data collection. Basically, right now, we just kind of collect everything that we can, both via the vSphere SOAP API and the SIM API. So it's a really overwhelming amount of data at the moment. We need help, and I'll go ahead and turn this into a call for community help. We need help whittling down what we collect to the set of things that's really important. So if anybody's interested in helping a project do that, please see me after. And again, this is another community contribution. Uh, Ronnie up front here was involved in this, and one of his colleagues at the uh, Hochschule in Fulda, uh, Mr. Christian Pop, I think was the lead implementer of this thing. Very, very, very cool stuff. We're very happy about it. So this is sort of a diagram that just gives you an idea of how the provisioning happens conceptually. Again, you point open an MS at your vCenter, and all of this stuff turns into all of this stuff. It's, it really is that simple once you've got it configured. It's almost zero effort. And here is a screenshot showing you what the monitoring looks like. Again, this is just the service assurance monitoring part. So these will turn red if the managed entity status goes to a bad state or if the host system for this host system goes to a bad state. And guess what you can do? You can turn those into notifications so you can actually wake somebody up in the middle of the night. Anybody who's interested in reading the white paper in German can just scan that, or you can just scan it from my slides later on. I can't really read it. Okay, we've got some other new stuff in terms of integration possibilities. I'll jump right into those too. We've got a new thing called the Syslog Northbounder. In fact, we have a new thing called Northbounders generally. Anybody know what a Northbound interface is? Okay, sort of a... Uh, a term borrowed from the high-end proprietary network management world. Northbound interface essentially just means a way to send information from one network management platform to another that's designed to consume and aggregate it, sort of a manager of managers situation. OpenNMS is often called on to talk to a northbound interface, and we've always in the past just kind of cobbled something together with SNMP traps or another mechanism, but now we actually have this Syslog Northbounder, which is designed specifically for being a northbound interface to other systems. It is, unlike our other event handling things from the past, it is actually alarm-centric rather than event-centric, which means if you get a million events that roll up into a single alarm, you can northbound just the single alarm instead of all million of those events, which can be a big help. You can have multiple configurable destinations for the syslog messages that we send, the format, of course, is completely customizable, so if you want to send it, say, to your Splunk, you could do that and just tell Splunk how to dissect it. Um, or Logstash, probably, because Logstash is free and awesome. We can transport the syslog messages over either UDP or TCP. Other transports will probably come online in the future. And other northbounders besides the syslog one that are still under work are ones for JMS, Java Messaging Services and for HTTP, which just basically lets you say do a get or a put to a URL to northbound an alarm. Okay, next integration bit that's updated is the JIRA ticketer integration. Who uses JIRA? Not so many, okay, a few, cool. Oh, so do we, I should raise my hand. <laughs> Um, we now use the 5.x REST API. Anybody still on JIRA pre-5.0? Good, then you should all just change to this because it's so much easier to set up than the old one which used the SOAP API. With the old one, you had to download the WSDL from your JIRA instance because everyone was unique. You had to build stub classes for it and then build the plugin against the stub classes which if you're not a Java developer really sucks. Uh, so it's, it's now, I think it's actually up to 6,000% easier to set up, but I wanted to be conservative here because you don't actually have to build code. You just have to configure URL, username, and password. Yeah? Um, Jira can, for this purpose, be considered a ticketing system. It's an issue tracking system from Atlassian, the same people who do Bamboo, Confluence, FishEye, a bunch of other stuff. It, it's proprietary for the record. Okay, next integration 
We have now Drools in the ticketing workflow. Who's used Drools? Okay, Drools is a business process management language from the Red Hat JBoss project, which they've just renamed to something whose name I can't ever remember. Something or other Fly, I think. Free Fly, I don't know, whatever. Um, it's still JBoss to me. We borrow the JBoss libraries, which let you write rules that encapsulate your business processes into your network management rules. So you can encapsulate things like which users should get assigned to which tickets automatically instead of having an operator have to do that stuff. You can look at, for instance, if it's a router in Austria, you should assign it to this group. If it's a switch in Hungary, you should assign it to this other group. Those sorts of decisions and others like them. Very abstract, um, probably a very steep learning curve, but still very, very powerful. And this is another contribution from the same people who from Canada gave us the access point monitor. Okay, another new ticketer integration is for the Remedy system. Who's used Remedy? I'm sorry. You can create tickets now in Remedy from OpenNMS. Uh, that's really just about all I can say about it because I haven't had a chance to play with this one yet. Um, there should be an Italian flag on this slide. I apologize that there's not because our colleague in Italy, Mr. Antonio Russo, created this one for us and uh, like everything he's ever done for the project, contributed it upstream. All right, so that's all the, uh, all the really major feature stuff. But we do have some performance improvements. Um, performance is a perennial problem when you're designing a network management platform that's designed to be massively scalable. Try as you might, you're always going to make stupid decisions that limit your scalability. So we've undone some of those and we've also uncovered some problems we didn't know we had as we've been encountering larger and larger environments, both at customers and at non-customer user sites. Um, two areas where we've done some improvements sort of to unchain our scalability are the provisioning subsystem, which is how we add nodes, interfaces, and services to the system. Uh, we've eliminated a whole bunch of places where it turned out we were doing unnecessary, unnecessary disk I.O. Sorry, my typo. Um, we, we now keep our disk I.O. to a minimum when we're doing the provisioning lifecycle, which is a big performance helper when you're dealing with tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of nodes. Um, that's what we consider huge. Uh, the, the downside of this change is that it, if you've got some clever scripts that are directly manipulating your provisioning data on disk, they're going to get really confused and broken. So if you're doing that kind of thing, um, probably see me after and consider moving your scripts to use the provisioning REST service instead because that's the way you want to be doing this stuff anyway. The other area where we've done some performance boosting is the event queue which is how OpenNMS takes in events, both from outside and internally. Uh, it used to be that the queue of events was unbounded in length, which was never really a problem as long as you gave it enough memory. But we've had some customers and users do some stress testing and found that when you start throwing millions of events per minute at it, you can get a clogged event queue. So we implemented in 1.12 the ability to bound the length of the queue at which point it'll start to discard events instead of falling over if that should ever happen, which nearly never has. But it's a problem now, so we decided we'd go ahead and fix it. Uh, most people won't notice this unless your event use case is very numerous events in short periods of time, uh, in which case it might bite you and you should know how to configure it, so see me after. All right, other new stuff. We've got some device coverage expansions. Um, I'm just gonna rattle off these vendors for the video. Acme Packet, Allot, Blade Network, Cisco Telepresence, um, Ericsson, Juniper, GGSN nodes, which are a GSM mobile stuff. Ericsson IP Works, which is also related to mobile networks, IP networks. Um, Isilon, which is now part of EMC, Pingtel, not sure what that's about. I thought they got sucked up by Nortel about a decade ago. Um, and of course, we've got now new support for VMware's SIM API, uh, for the Virtual Center 2.5 API, and for the vCenter 4.1 and 5.0 APIs as well. So basically, all the versions of VMware Virtual Center or vCenter that you might be using today are covered. We also have some LinkD improvements. 
we now expose the linked data for both querying and manipulation via a REST service. So it's much, much easier to manipulate it than it used to be. It used to be you essentially had to go to the database if you wanted to manipulate that stuff, which was really dirty and ugly. Now you can do it via REST, like we try to make everything available that way. LinkD also now supports OSPF as a source of adjacency data, and it also now supports LLDP as a source of adjacency data. This is in addition to CDP, uh, IP route table via SNMP, and a number of other mechanisms that have already been supported. Uh, this is another one with the Italian flag on it because it also came from Mr. Russo. He's fixed a whole bunch of corner cases, uh, and those really happened in the course of a bunch of consulting work that he did at Juniper and at T-Systems here in Deutschland. So it's, it's, LinkD is something we like to joke about because it seems to have a never-ending stream of problems associated with it. I think that's because link discovery is a really hard problem, but it just keeps getting better and better, and the set of people's networks for which it will be useful continues to grow. So give it a try if you think it might. Cool, all right, so now shiny stuff because people are starting to fall asleep on me. This is well-timed. Uh, the single big shiny thing, I consider the VMware thing to be shiny, but I covered it under infrastructure, so I'll cover this uh, near real-time graphing. You see what we did there with the name, NRTG? Yeah, uh-huh, okay. The uh, NRTG feature allows you to launch from any SNMP-derived data source graph a real-time or near real-time data browser. Um, this, this changes the way data collection is done and presented for the period of time that you're actually running that NRTG instance. You can configure the interval for the collection to be as little as 250 milliseconds. You can actually make it smaller if you hack the URL, but I don't really recommend that because you can really beat the hell out of your SNMP agents doing it faster than that. And anyway, as somebody mentioned this morning, most of your SNMP agents on devices these days only update their counters and gauges about every five seconds. So the usefulness of getting that fine-grained is probably questionable at best. But you can crank it down as, as low as that if you want. The SNMP operations are all done server-side, so it's not like some Java craplet running in your browser and you need to have special access in order to do this stuff. It's actually, the data is actually gathered on the server-side and you know that the server already has that network permission to do SNMP operations because it's doing them otherwise, and it's shipped to your browser via ActiveMQ through the web app. It's, it's pretty slick stuff. Uh, we plot the data in the browser in d3.js, which is an HTML5 dynamic plotting framework, and this was a GSOC 2012 project. Uh, I think that student was from Estonia. I think I got that flag right and uh, it was mentored by one of our German community guys. And I got a screenshot of that. So the inset here is what the regular graph looks like. You click this link that says start NRT graphing and you get this bigger one. And I, it actually is a bigger window. It's a, it's a large plot area. Um, and you can see that we're, the timeline on this is actually seconds. Oh shoot. I guess it scrolled off. It did say 1519 here and 1518 over there. When I took the screenshot, I guess it had advanced just then. But we're, we're down to the second resolution level now. It's very, very helpful for the heat of battle troubleshooting kinds of situations. Uh, very, very cool stuff. All right, so we're done with the real shiny stuff. Now for the real boring stuff, the architectural changes. Uh, we're now requiring Java 6 or greater which is actually at end of life. It's actually past end of life, so get with the program. If you're still running Java 5, you really ought to be, well, you really ought to be on Java 7. We've also introduced OSGI and Carafe, Spring Framework 3, and Spring, Spring Security 3.1. So dig a little bit into the Java requirement. Yeah, Java 6 is actually past its end of life now, um, but you can, with 1.12, use either an Oracle or an OpenJDK build of Java 6. We really recommend for best performance the Oracle 7 JDK. I'm not happy that we run less well on OpenJDK 6 and 7, um, but OpenJDK 8 has some real promise coming online. So once we're able to support OpenJDK 8, 
I think it will be as good as Oracle's JDK 8, which is really, really good news for people who like free software. OSGI and Carafe, how many of you guys know what that is? Either of those? No Java developers in here then? Okay. Um, OSGI is sort of the new hotness in our technology stack. It's uh, basically, it's a frame, framework for making, more, making modularity easier in Java, making your dependencies easier to resolve, uh, having multiple versions of the same dependency if you need the ability to do that. It just solves a lot of problems that have traditionally plagued Java applications like ours. Uh, again, this, this lets us build greater modularity, not just single system modularity, but also scale out horizontal scalability kinds of modularity. Uh, by putting these things on an event bus, which we'll be doing in a future release, you'll now be able, thanks to OSGI, to spin up this system and say, hey, you just collect data. This one, you tell them you just receive SNMP traps, and you, you just select, uh, just receive SNMP performance data and maybe some syslog events from this backwater part of the network that's inconvenient from a firewall perspective. We'll actually be able to do that as part of our model, which we've never been able to do before. Currently in OpenNMS 1.12, there are just a few bits that run under the Carafe OSGI container, which is from the Apache project. Um, but the next major release, which will be called probably 1.14, will be entirely an OSGI platform application. And that's where we actually start getting into the distributed operation. Okay, other architectural boring stuff, dependency injection framework, Spring framework, 3.0, anybody use Spring? It's cool, it makes Java suck less. Um, it, it is again, it's a long standing part of our stack. It's not new hotness, it's just an updated hotness. Um, OpenNMS 1.10 used Spring Framework 2.5. Unless you're a developer, you won't notice the change. Even if you are a developer, you probably won't notice the change. We use another artifact from the Apache Spring guys, uh, or VMware Spring guys now, I guess they are called Spring Security, which is just an authorization, authentication, and accounting framework for Java. Uh, it's, again, another long-standing part of our stack. In OpenNMS 1.10, we use Spring Security 2.0, which had a different configuration layout. Again, most users won't notice the change. If you are authenticating your OpenNMS users via LDAP or Radius or Active Directory or some other external authentication mechanism, then you will need to make changes to your configuration due to this upgrade, so come see me after and we'll talk. Okay, that is all I've got in terms of the talk itself. I had a live demo ready to field on my laptop, but my laptop hates the Beamer, so anybody who wants to see a live demo of some of this stuff, please uh, come see me and I'll be happy to run it one-on-one -on -one or one-on-few with you. How am I doing on time? Doing all right. Okay, so uh, I'm happy to take your questions now or after. Uh, you can reach me at jeffg.org on Twitter. OpenNMS project is at OpenNMS on Twitter. And you can find me as user jeffg in the hash OpenNMS channel on irc.freenode.net. All right, I am open to questions if you have them. Just a, just a second. Oh, that's a kind of sport. <laughs> <laughs> After the lunch. You mentioned that you are querying quite a lot of information from the vSphere uh, SOAP API. Have you pointed it at a, at a large vSphere installation? And if you have, what happened? <laughs> that's a very good one. Do I need to repeat it? I don't know. Was that good enough? Okay, so he got it on the mic. Uh, Ronnie, would you take that? Can you can you speak to that? Because you've you've played it with it more than I have. Let me just hand this to you. Um, yes, um, we pointed it to, or we had a, um, a big setup uh, at a customer site with uh, around um, around about uh, between uh, one thousand one thousand five hundred VMs, and it um, works pretty well. Um, the big issue is uh, the data collection part. Uh, we're collecting all the data from the vSphere vCenter, which means that you collect all metrics directly from VMware, which can you can grab a lot of data out of uh, the vCenter for each virtual machine. You have a lot of metrics. Um, what we did is basically the same thing uh, like um, you're doing with an SNMP walk or um, the JMX configurator. We grab 
all metrics out of the vCenter and create a configuration for OpenMS, but um, if you don't need all that uh, information, then it's easy to delete just uh, the unnecessary metrics you don't want to collect. So um, it is, we try to, to reverse the pattern to say it's easier to delete stuff uh, instead of creating configuration stuff. So. Um, yeah, that is the, the, the uh, collecting the, the metrics is the biggest part. I think you can collect over 200 or 250 metrics just from a single VM. That's a, that's a lot of stuff you can gra grab. Okay, thanks. Others? No other questions? Okay. Nothing else? All right. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you all for your time.